This is the second video in a series where we are rebuilding the transmission in this 1931 Model A Roadster. Last time we took the transmission out of the car. This time we're going to look at the parts that are in the transmission and talk about how it works. This is the casting for the gearbox as well as the casting for the tower. And if we use these to assemble the transmission, you can't see the gears, you can't see what's going on very well. So I built a plywood casting, let's call it, with very similar dimensions. They're not exact, but they're gonna be close enough to illustrate what I'm after today. This is the main drive gear. This end is where the pilot bearing goes, and then the splines for the clutch disc. This is where the main shaft bearing goes. There is an oil hole here, and kind of some funny looking gears. They're actually multi-purposed. In the middle is a regular spur gear that drives the counter shaft cluster gear. These lower points on the end are actually splines. We will see how they get used in a second. Roller bearings are used to connect to the main shaft inside the transmission. These two shafts can either turn independently or they can be locked together with the second and high sliding gear. This gear has female splines on one side that match the main drive gear splines and it has female splines on the opposite side that match main shaft splines and can slide back and forth on this main shaft. So when the transmission is in third gear and there's direct drive from the engine, these two shafts are locked together. If the transmission is in neutral or any other gear, these two shafts spin independently. I put the bearing on and slipped it into our wooden casting. Again, this end is attached to the clutch disc and the other end provides power inside the transmission. The next thing we're going to look at is the cluster gear. As the name implies, this is a cluster of gear. The first big one is a drive gear, then there's second, first, and reverse. This assembly is commonly called a counter shaft for a manual transmission. Three quarter inch shaft with roller bearings on either end. And I noticed here, now that I'm looking at the video, I've got these in backwards. The long one goes on the reverse side with a spacer in between. Slide the cluster gear in and slide the shaft on. Now you can see why this is called a counter shaft because the rotation is counter to the main drive gear. This is the reverse idler gear. Pretty simple bronze bushing on a uh, three quarter inch shaft. The reverse idler gear runs opposite direction as the rest of the counter shaft. And that's how you get the reverse gear. We'll talk about that later. You can also see that reverse idler gear sits just a little higher than the last gear set on the cluster gear shaft. The counter shaft cluster gear is always spinning whenever the main drive gear is moving. This is the main shaft. We've already seen it a little bit. One end is where the roller bearings go and two sliding gears. The one I'm holding here is low and reverse and has six splines that match the main shaft. Second and high gear also has the same splines and it slides on the shaft as well. We've already talked about that a little bit. Of 
On goes the roller bearing. Put the main shaft in. Slider gears go on. Low and reverse goes on first, then high and second. Now it's starting to look like a transmission. We've got the main shaft in and the counter shaft in. As these two sliding gears slide back and forth, this is first gear. This is neutral with sliding gears not engaged with anything. This is second gear. This is third gear. And finally, this is reverse. Notice how this low and reverse gear misses the counter shaft by just a little bit, but engages with the reverse idler. You can actually shift the gears by hand. Reach down into the top of the transmission and move stuff around. But that'd be a big mess and maybe even dangerous. That's why we have a transmission tower, to shift the gears from a safe distance. Here are the internal parts to the transmission tower. These are shift fork shafts, and they have cutouts here to accommodate the shift plunger. They precisely locate the forks, which in turn precisely locate slider gears on the main shaft. The shift plungers uh, are spring-loaded inside the casting. And you can see they got like a half circle there that engaged the shifter shaft. This is neutral position for both forks. This is going to be reverse position. This is first gear, back to neutral again. And here this is third gear, neutral, and second on the left fork. These two forks are identical. They're just installed, one's forward, the other's backwards. And they both have a cutout here to accommodate the ball on the end of the shift lever. And they're both oriented so that they grab those sliding gears in the main shaft and the transmission. Here's how the forks slide into that coupling on the slider gears and they move it back and forth on the shaft. Okay, on goes the wooden tower onto the wooden casting. This is actually working out okay. You can pause it here if you want to laugh at me. <laughs> All right, that's enough. This is the shift lever. It's got a couple of pins here that hold it in the top of the casting to prevent it from rotating. The casting has a couple of cutouts for the pins and a machined area to accept the bottom of the shifter. This is probably pretty obvious, but the fulcrum for the shift lever is at the top of the tower casting. So when you move the shift lever down and to the left, for example, for first gear, the ball that controls the shifter fork is going to be moving up and to the right, the opposite direction. The shift lever is the last thing to go to our little assembly, and you can see the ball end is resting now on the cutout in the top of the forks. The transmission is now assembled, and we're going to watch it cycle through the gears. I'm going to pause this and explain what you're looking at. The main picture here is the body of the transmission, which you've already seen. The view on the top left is the top of the shifter forks. I'm trying to show how the shift lever moves the forks, the forks then shift the sliding gears and move this transmission into various positions. I also added a shift pattern, but the shift pattern is as if we're viewing the transmission from the right hand side, which we are, not what you're used to seeing the shift pattern when you're sitting in the car. Okay, here we're in neutral just shifted the first. You can see the left fork is holding the second and high gear on the slider shaft in neutral position, while the right fork is cycling between first and reverse. 
Now the right fork is holding first and reverse gear in neutral, while the left fork moves the second and high gear. There's third gear, and then back to neutral. Second and third one more time, just because it's fun to watch. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on power flow and transmission ratios. Here's our gearbox again in neutral. That counter shaft is always spinning and power flows but has no place to go because none of the slider gears are engaged yet. You can see the output shaft is not moving. Here the transmission is in third gear. So the main drive gear and the main shaft are locked together. We have an input to output ratio of one. Now the transmission is in second gear and you can see the power flowing through second gear. To calculate the ratio now, you need to count the teeth on the gear and do a little bit of math. Output divided by input. So in this case, 31 divided by 16 times 23 divided by 24 gives you a ratio of 1.85. So the engine needs to turn almost two revolutions to turn the output shaft one revolution. Here is the power flow for first gear. And you got to count the teeth again and do the math again. In first gear, the engine connected to the input shaft turns three revolutions, or a little more than that, for every one revolution on the output shaft. The math is the same for reverse, but now you're going through that idler gear, so you got an extra ratio to calculate. So reverse has the highest ratio, uh, 3.75. So if you ever want to win a go slow race in a Model A, do it in reverse. This Model A transmission is really super simple, even crude uh, by modern standards. But you have to kind of put yourself in the historical context of 1927. Steam power was the king in the 19th and early 20th century. Steam engines did not require a transmission. The basic design for the transmission used in the Model A was really developed in the 1890s by the French, first introduced in 1894. The Model A transmission was better than the Model T and as good as anybody else had in the late 1920s. Well, that's it for this video. If you've made it this far, you kind of owe me a comment, uh, if you're willing. Next time, we'll put these parts in the real casting and get it ready to put it back in the car.